So if mother and father, if they were playing the spiritual Olympics, the mother is going to win the gold medal, the silver and the bronze medal, and the poor dads like ourselves will just come home with a participation certificate, all right? She win all the medals out there. That is the status of women, mothers in Islam. Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I start in the name of God, the most beneficent and the most merciful, and greet all of you with the greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Which means peace of God be upon each single one of you. Now, those from the Christian faith, you'll be familiar with this same term, peace be upon you. This was uttered by Jesus when he used to meet his disciples. Like, for example, when he went to the upper chamber, it says in the Gospel of John chapter 19, chapter 20 verse 19, the very first thing he said to his people was peace be upon you. So we say we Muslims are followers of all the prophets. May that be Moses and Jesus and Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Noah, David, Solomon and the last one prophet Muhammad, peace be upon every single prophet. Now just to carry on with our you know, honored guest what they have mentioned, the rights of neighbors and the minorities and many many rights I will carry on with the rights of women this is so important because nowadays you know women and women issue issues and gender they are the buzzwords out there so in that context of the rights and the guidance that God has given to humanity what are some of the rights that Islam has given to women all right so I will build a case that what were the rights that women had before the 7th century? It's important. So when it comes to India, we have a friend from India. I was born and raised in India. Uh, Dr. Musa is from India, right? India, Hyderabad. So in India, so this is quoting from Encyclopedia Britannica. Subjugation was the cardinal principle. Day and night must women be held by their protectors. In a state of dependence, say the Manu, right? The rule of inheritance was agnostic. That is, the descent traced through males to the exclusion of females. You know, this practice of sati, it was abolished, I think, in the 1950s. What used to happen, those who are not familiar with this, in the couple, if the husband passes away, uh, she, he was cremated. But along with the husband, it is expected that the wife also goes inside the pyre and she suicides, she kills herself. That was the norm all throughout history for thousands of years until it was prohibited in the 1950s. When it comes to the Roman Empire, what were the rights or no rights that the women had? Take a look at this. I will just read the yellow part which I highlighted. If married, she and her property pass under the power of her husband. So she's a property under the Roman law. The wife was purchased property of her husband and like a slave acquired only for his benefit. A woman could not exercise any civil or public office, could not be witness, could not be surety, tutor or, or the curator. She could not adopt or be adopted or make a will or a contract. That was a reality in the bulk of history according to Encyclopedia Britannica. What about the Mosaic law, right? What about the Jewish law? To betroth a wife to oneself meant simply to acquire possession of her by payment of the purchase of money. The consent of the girl was not necessary. So when we come to Islam and the rights, we will take a look what rights and what consent that Islam has given to women. So according to the Mosaic law again, the woman being a man's property, his right to divorce her follows as a matter of course. According to the English law, right, the English law recent, all real property which a wife held at the time of a marriage became a possession of her husband. Not so in Islam, right? We will come to that inshallah. So what about Islam? What about Islam? It's really important for us to know that sometimes the media only highlights the culture and it gives a perception that that is what Islam teaches. So it's important for us to have a demarcation between the culture and the beautiful, perfect, practical, beneficial practices of Islam. 
All right, so let's uh, not highlight the culture because the topic is about what does Islam says. So respect of mothers, respect of mothers. You know, one time a person came to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and asked him a really important question. You know, of all the people in the world, who should be my love, my kindness, and my honor should go towards? And the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said, your mother. And the person was curious. Okay, who after the mother? And the Prophet, he said, uh, your mother. The person became more curious. Okay, fine, after the mother, then who next? And the Prophet said, your mother. your mother, right? The fourth time the person asked the question, and now the Prophet said, your, <laughs> all the fathers are quiet to say now, right? The Prophet said the fourth time, your father. So if mother and father, if they were playing the spiritual Olympics, the mother is going to win the gold medal, the silver and the bronze medal, and the poor dads like ourselves will just come home with a participation certificate, all right? She win all the medals out there. That is the status of women, mothers in Islam. What about wives? Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that uh, amongst the Muslims, the most perfect as regard his faith is the one whose character is the most excellent and the best amongst you is the one who is the best towards his wife wow you know when i give uh, marriage advice to the young couples and mashallah our esteemed guest over here one of the things that we say to the groom is that this is the statement from prophet muhammad peace be upon him he was the best husband so we are supposed to follow his example that we should be the best towards our spouses all right here comes a really amazing rights that Islam has given to women. So what I have done is, I have compared the rights Islam gave in the 7th century compared to the rights our ladies in this country that they acquired after so many rallies and so many you know, protests and so much suffrage. Let's take a look, look at the first one here. The right to vote or the right to have a say in the political process. Our country, not until 1920, Islam gave that right to have uh, a woman to have a say in the political process way back in the 7th century. The right to own property. You know, in the state of Illinois, not until 1861, Islam gave that right to women, Muslim women, way back in the 7th century. So Islam was way ahead by, by 12th centuries, I would say, right? So now it's important for us, we're not speaking about a culture in Afghanistan, Pakistan, or you know, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, Yemen, Lebanon, Syria, we are talking about Islam. Right to inherit. You know, right now there is no guarantee unless and until a person is placed in the will, in the secular law in the USA. But that right is there guaranteed in the Islamic Sharia law. For mothers, for daughters, for sons and fathers, uh, and the immediate family, the right to keep her last name. Islam gave that right to the ladies that in the marriage, she can retain her last name. Now we can just take this for granted in the 21st century, 2023, but this was not the case. Take a look at this, not until 1855 in this country. Islam was way ahead by at least 13 centuries, even for that right of women. More rights to come, right? More rights to come, right to education. Not until 1840, a lady in this country, she won the right to gain higher education. So when our ladies in this country, when they were fighting for the rights to go to college and to own property and to have the last name, Muslim ladies, they were the movers and the shakers, they were building hospitals and the pharmacies and they were building you know, institutions. So really important question to all of you, right? Which university, according to Encyclopedia Britannica and UNESCO, which university is the oldest continuous university in the whole world? This is a quiz question to all of you. Faryan. Which one? Faryan. Okay, mashallah, she knows the answer. <laughs> all right. Uh, okay. So what, what our sister is saying is, this university, the oldest continuous university in the whole world, it is in the country of Morocco. Okay, which century and who was that lady? Okay, so it was a Muslim lady by the way, right? Important thing, 
a Muslim lady established the oldest continuous university in the whole world. And her name is Sister uh, Fatima al Fahriya. And which century, which year? 859. Way before Oxford and Harvard and Cambridge and Penn State and UIC, any campus in the whole world, it was a Muslim lady wearing the hijab. She laid the foundation for the oldest continuous university in the whole world. And she was empowered by women's rights. The right to work, 7th century. The right to keep her assets, again, 7th century, not until 1862 and 1861, 18th, uh, you know, 19th century. The right to give a consent in marriage. You know, we just take this for granted. Not until 18th century or 19th century in this country, right? Uh, precisely 1848 was the very first time when the state of New York gave the right for the lady in this country, uh, her consent is required. Before that, it was not required, by the way. The right to initiate divorce. In the 1800s in this country, way back 7th century in Islam. So Islam was ahead, far ahead, by centuries, right? More than 1,000 years. So when we speak about women's rights, women's rights are human rights. And Islam was the very first one in that comprehensive and that detail and that perfection for the human rights for women. So this is Islam and these are the human rights and uh, this is the wonderful faith and the guidance that God has given to all of humanity. If we abide by that, inshallah, God willing, oppression would be gone and the rule of law would be based upon justice, morality, equality and the outcome would be nothing less than peace. And that is what Islam offers to all of you. Thank you very much. So be